What's going on, everybody? My name is Tyler Walsh. Today, I'm joined by Mike McLaughlin. Hell yeah. And this is The Music Report. This is a podcast about industry news, emerging artists, and everything music. Um, so I've had the honor of knowing you for, like, what, a year and a half, a year now. Yeah. Um, how did you get to, I guess, for, for context for the podcast, who are you and how did you get here uh, to where you are today and what do you do exactly? So I started a blog back in 2014 called That Raw Sound. It's not really active anymore, but that was like the, the root of everything, really. I started getting more into journalism. While I was doing that, I fell in love with management and I did all sorts of things with management. I started managing a ton of clients, all different types of clients from all over different countries, and sort of scaled it back and, and sort of found a sweet spot of like exactly who I'm trying to work with on the management front. So right now it's Soundboy Quad, who's locked up, Free Quad. Free Quad. Um, Kilche, of course, greatest fine artist out there. Um, Chippy Chippy, who's originally from Senegal. He lives in Harlem probably heard about him from Mudboy, Shaq West's uh, debut album. He had a song named after him. Um, he's more on like the, the model, comedian front. Sort of, you know, I don't like to like throw labels on, on what it is any clients are doing because I feel like I like to leave it like open-ended, you know, for whatever it is that their vision is. Um, but yeah, and I started diving even deeper into journalism all the while when I was working on the management stuff. So that's how I ended up at 137 here at Vayner. And um, yeah, lately it's just been heavy focus on, on 137 and management. So that's pretty much where we're at right now. And I would be fucking up if I didn't shout out Daily Chiefers here because Daily Chiefers was like, and, and on the same note, AR and Bell, because once I started being Bell and AR's assistant, that gave me like a real look at the industry and like what's going on. And then Bell was pretty high up at Chiefers at the time. Um, and shout out to Joey and Brick from Chiefers as well. Um, they set me up with a writing account at Chiefers, and then from there I feel like that's when I really got into the journalism shit and really started understanding what's going on and, and have grown a lot since then. But none of it would have happened without that. So appreciate all y'all for real. Hell yeah. And I think something that's really cool about your style is you also put an emphasis on the producers too. Like... You, you do highlights, you do spotlights, you did even a, a whole playlist on Spotify dedicated towards highlighting um, producers. What brought you to that? Because I think that producers are easily underpaid and they don't get as much attention, but they, you know, they create the sound that is popular today. Like, Totally. I feel like producers, photographers, videographers are all in like, and it doesn't end there. Songwriters like go on and on, but like a lot of those type of roles are overlooked because it's like the industry's job to shine a light on the artist and really be heavy on that. But at the same time, it's easy to forget who really is making moves, putting shit together, like really making songs, really making videos, like who's really doing the things that are helping to propel these artists forward. So producers, photographers, videographers, all of them are, are artists in their own right. And, you know, lately, with the whole world of social media, I feel like it's given the right foundation for producers to get recognized and, and to be heard and, and understood, like their role and all that. So mm. from managing some producers, I, I produce myself, like I definitely have gotten like a pretty big understanding of like what it is they do, just how crucial their role is, just how underrepresented they've been. Um, and just how bright the future is for, for producers and what that looks like. Like, you've seen it with Metro Boomin, and there are plenty of other examples, you know, like AR is another example of, of producers dropping their own music under their own name on DSPs. And we're really, really just getting started with that. So I feel like we're entering into an era where there's plenty of independent empowerment to allow them to actually have the right sort of platform to, to be known. So we're really just getting started with that. Yeah, that's so powerful. And even like the the rise of, like you said, social media and, you know, there's never been, if you're willing to put in the work, you can get the attention. And then the willing to be able to fail and iterate and keep going, um, there's never been a better time to be any sort of creative. So that's exciting. 
Um, but yeah, on this podcast, we talk about industry news, emerging artists, all that. So I'd love to get your two cents um, just to help either, you know, if it's an artist on the other line listening or manager, exec, anything like that, um, just to try to see how the industry is going to shape and the artists that are going to shape it. So I would love to know. Um, I don't know if you've seen, I'm probably sure you have a Spotify stream on event. There's a lot of updates, a lot of uh, controversial ones with discovery mode, and they're going to start doing like uh, – in uh, vertical in feed videos uh, with creator tools. So I, I'm curious, like, I'm sure you have some opinions on that too. I'd love to hear that. I feel like uh, originally when you saw other socials sort of like mimicking TikTok, it, it's similar to like, oh, like this artist is biting that artist's style. But over time, I feel like it's become clear that it's more of just like a format thing of like yeah. this as a format makes the most sense. And it's beyond like the specifics of like, you know, the, the creative angle. It's more like, this is what people are consuming at that level. So everyone's trying to align with that. So the, the vertical feed makes sense with Spotify. I think um, discovery mode is interesting. I was talking about that with uh, an artist and another uh, person in the industry the other day of like what that looks like. And honestly, I think if you're an upcoming artist and you're really trying to get exposure on the platform, it makes total sense to do. I mean, there's some questions that come with that. Like, if you were to join, does that mean that it's like a, a permanent Perpet button that you're hitting? In, in perpetuity, you're losing all of your royalty, like exactly. getting your royalties cut in half or like- Exactly, I think, I think it'd be cool if like, you could do it on a song by song basis of like, you, you say you have a whole rollout planned and you have a few singles off an album um, or say you're just dropping singles indefinitely. It's like to be able to have the freedom of like, all right, this is a marketing play to take a lower percentage for the sake of getting people's attention on that platform. I think that could be really cool, super empower for, empowering for artists. I mean, Trapital just did something the other day talking about like where the industry is at uh, money-wise and like what problems lie in that. And I think when music switched from like records to CDs wasn't as crazy of a shift CDs to iTunes was like it seemed crazy at the time but really still you're making the same money exactly you're selling like per units like you're selling like per project per song but then once like Napster and LimeWire got into the picture they're competing against like free music yeah. so Spotify kind of saved them from being fucked exactly like, losing all that money exactly and now we're sort of at like i feel like shit sways back and forth you know and and now we're sort of reaching a point where we're like all right this is dope that it's so accessible and you could pay a subscription fee and then all of a sudden you have access to everything that's radically different from what the model has been to date and i think problems have like arisen from that where it's like Artists aren't getting paid as much as they want to. Spotify's not getting paid as much as they want to. The labels aren't. So it's like really manifested in a way where like shit like that, the discovery mode, uh, it makes sense. Cause it's, maybe it's a band-aid, you know, but at least it gives artists and, and managers and teams like an option uh, for exposure. Cause you know, like payola, it's like, yeah. you're sort of, your hands are tied where if you're not rocking with a label or someone that's got that pull, like how do you, get listeners' attention on Spotify. Yeah. Yeah, that brings up a lot of great points. Even going back a little bit towards when you're talking about that shift and how, you know, Spotify, you know, the royalties aren't where, um, you know, where they should be or, you know, whether you got a certain opinion one or the other, it's like, you know, it's fine where it's at or um, obviously, you know, all of us want to see artists get paid more. Um, there's been a, like, I just like to think back too to like, you know, 1800s, 1700s, like you weren't paying to listen to music. You would pay to go to like a theater or like, you know, so I definitely have come a long way. I think, you know, it's building new revenue models on top of the current music industry, which is exciting for like NFTs, I think, like, you know, to build like a, a membership, like a fan pass or something like that, you know, to make oh, up yeah. for that, that lost revenue of like, you're not listening, you're not making as much when you listen to music or when music streams. Absolutely. That's like, that's like another part of the balance. Like when I was saying, you know, shit sort of sways because it's in that spot where 
like the, the industry model is the way it is like that opened the door for web three to serve as like that sort of subscription and like super fan mode yeah. of like, yeah, I'm going to pay, you know, not only pay per drop, but I get to support the artist in that way. And I get to prove Util- like, yeah. like I was there yeah. at this time. Yeah. And you get the there. utility too. It's like, if you get a free concert ticket, like you get a free concert ticket. If you yeah. get like exclusive merch, you get exclusive merch. Yeah. That's a valid point. And what do you think is, um, you know, think about consumer behavior, um, just being, you know, working in an ad agency, uh, thinking about like from Gary's POV, just boss Gary V. Um, what do you think is the friction between, you know, the average consumer and Web3, especially with music right now? Is it is it the, you know, there's so many tokens out there. It's so confusing. Is it setting up wallets? Like, how do you think that we can fr- like create a frictionless experience for supporting an artist on, on some sort of blockchain? I feel like whenever there's something that works that was popularized even for a moment, you got to keep an eye on it, especially when people aren't talking about it as much. Because I feel like the people that are really high up, be it in finance or whatever other industry, like that's when they're making their moves. That's when it's like the most beneficial for them mm-hmm. to, to make big plays. So I feel like right now, the biggest issue to date with Web3 that's been there is the the sort of barrier to entry with, like, say you have an artist who's got plenty of super fans. They've got, like, hundreds of super fans. Um, and they're down to, to subscribe to that sort of thing, but they don't know how. A, you've got to explain it to them. And even if you explain it to them, who knows if the, it's going to register properly. Um, and, and B, I feel like because of that, there's been a very particular market of who's there buying it. Like, I feel like it's, it's a, a niche market that's specific to people who are comfortable working in that sort of environment and, like, feel like it's understandable. Yeah. Whereas the biggest part of the market is on the side of not understanding that, but, but wanting, like, the similar perks that that offers. So I feel like we're in a spot right now where it's sort of waned for the time being, and... You know, I notice in different Web3 environments, like, there's sort of, like, a use of language that's, like, preventing people from understanding what's going yeah. on. Like, mint. Like, nobody knows what mint means. Like, what? Like it's also, like, the word mint comes from, like, the, the U.S. Treasury. Like, mm-hmm. you know, they mint money. Like, it's, like, the U.S. mint, you know? Absolutely. So, so there's already, like, a financial, like, that's a different topic, but financial stipulation that comes with NFTs I feel like also has to kind of be removed. And That's a perfect example. Like, I, I'm super super into language um and that ties into marketing that ties into like management journalism all of it and i feel like that barrier is so real where it's like what's your intention if you want people to understand you want people to have access you could word things in a way that that they already understand you know and i i totally get the appeal of like you know creating something new and new terms and all that. But if you think about marketing teams at labels or wherever, any sort of industry, one of their main jobs is making shit easily digestible. Like, can it be understood by your average person? And with Web3, it's not there yet, but I do see like a light at the end of the tunnel where onboarding people into Web3 is going to be easier and talking about web3 and everything that goes on in it is going to be easier definitely it's just like social media like people didn't understand instagram or tiktok especially tiktok three years ago people were hating on it till the pandemic hit then that's all they had you know so it's uh, it's definitely exciting i definitely want to speaking of tiktok move into uh tiktok um you know feels like i mean it doesn't feel like it is a fact that almost all the records on billboard charts are they're breaking on tiktok first um, especially with sped up songs, what are what are your opinions on that? Because um, people are saying that, uh, like for example, Escapism by Ray with the zero uh, zero seven zero shake remix, that um, that sent that song into the into the Billboard charts. It wasn't streaming as quickly as it was until that blew up on TikTok, and it was a fan account nonetheless too, which is interesting. So, what do you think about? Um, the current state of TikTok and sped up like remixes or songs? I think it's inclusive from a standpoint of like the doors open for fans to 
go beyond being a fan and engage with the music from a creative standpoint. And that is like in the same sort of boat as like DJs and producers having the ability to make more of a name for themselves in the process of helping artists blow up even more. Um, and I think it, it's cool that there's a, a platform where there's that level of engagement, like beyond just like the making of it, which, you know, we mentioned that that's dope, but the consumption of it, like, I can't even count how many Ice Spice remixes there are on, on TikTok that it's are crazy. like super popular. Crazy. And I think that's sort of like a fun element, similar to like back when SoundCloud was like the shit. One of the coolest things is like if a really hot record comes out, you know that there's going to be several remixes that you're really liking. And I feel like TikTok's reintroducing that. And it's reintroducing SoundCloud as a platform too, where it's like, say you're hearing a remix that you're like, yeah, there's no chance this is on Spotify or Apple Music. You check the comments. I guarantee you, if you look up the song ID that someone comments, you can find it on on, uh, SoundCloud. And I think it it sort of help like reinvigorate the the music ecosystem in a cool way definitely and what's even uh what's interesting about it too is i was reading on a billboard article they were saying that it's not like a, like a big majority of them are djs but there's also this small portion that are just fans yeah. and they just have access to like band lab which is this new app where you can like literally make a song in your pocket which is like you know you know, it's, you don't need a studio anymore. All you need is a pair of Apple headphones and like, it's like, what? So it's cool to see like also fan engagement in, in that way for anybody with like a little bit of um, ability to, to navigate a, a, a phone DAW, if you would call it that. Um, but yeah, super cool. Also want to talk about catalog acquisitions, the hot topic of mm-hmm. like, I feel like the industry for the past two years. Um, Metro just sold his catalog future earlier in the year. I think it was 2022 he did. Um, I feel like everybody's selling their catalog, a lot of different opinions on that, especially with like, you know, you know, how that's going to affect like, you know, future streaming models or like how, how money's going to shape for, for those catalogs in the future. I think that at face value, you see like numbers in the hundreds of millions and you're like holy shit like that is that's crazy they just they're good for life their grandkids are good i'm gonna allude to a point troy carter made about if you i think it was basquiat he used in this example maybe it was warhol they were at the point in their artistic career where they were selling one artistic work in the hundreds of millions of dollars like compared to artists on the other side i think he it was Bob Dylan or some some songwriter um, that had a crazy catalog. You compared that um, with one of these famous painters, and it, there wasn't a huge disparity between the price of one work from the painter and the price of the entire catalog from the artist. So I think, like I said, at face value, it's an impressive number, but if you're really like thinking about it, how do we help artists get to the point where recording artists to the point where their single works are valued in a similar frame as, as um, you know, painters and, and some of these higher grossing types of artists. So I think that was a really cool point that like showed something that's already happened in the art world where people are, are making that type of money for their work. Um, and yeah, as a byproduct of like the whole streaming uh framework in music and how that works out like yeah i get it but i think we've got to be optimistic about the future of it and especially if it's in literally every single person's interest the labeled managers artists if it's in all their interests to to make it more of like a, a profitable uh scenario with how it's structured then let's let's be more optimistic with the the price of uh their entire catalog oh, yeah. acquisitions put that perfectly i agree 100 percent. it's like everybody eats everybody gets a bag everybody's happy you know labels recoup they get some interest on top who cares Mm -hmm. you know um but i I want to shift this conversation over to artists um talk about some artists that um shaping the industry in real time uh and also i want to talk about a group that um i know that you fuck with on the heavy um you know I think it was two weeks ago we got to got to see benny the butcher live um we had 
you know we had one of conway's artists in here uh earlier today shout out jay skis yes sir um but love to talk about griselda bsf like um because there isn't i i don't know a single person um that goes harder for like griselda bsf like even drum works like you know i would love to like you know if you if you want to talk about that that a little bit definitely i think griselda moves in a way that like defies everything else we're talking about like the, the current model of music and like oh why it's not profitable it's like they're not they're not complaining about that shit they're over there getting money they're selling merch for crazy amounts of money that fans aren't thinking twice about and that speaks to the quality of the art they're putting out where they're not they're not ripping off their fans the, every single product that they put together be it music be it merch records anything you expect the highest quality and that makes it fair for them to be able to to operate that way i i had mentioned i worked uh, a merch table at this armani show and i really got to see it firsthand like just how willing fans are to drop crazy amounts of bread to support griselda because what they built is just that easy to fuck with um and i think it's attention to detail on the music front on the brand front on the merchandise front like everything across the board even production like within the music and they they show hella love to the producers that they're working with like across the board they they pay very close attention i think it's paid off a lot and it's set the stage for them to create their own imprints and and other sort of ventures that they're going to make a lot of money and they're creating or helping to create the next generation of artists that are going to do their thing in the same way oh yeah it's always exciting to see uh for for the audience watching uh the reason i asked that i'm from buffalo um it's not every day you know anybody talks about rappers from buffalo and it's kind of cool to see not even just buffalo but you know smaller markets too cincinnati jacksonville all these like random cities not even just across america but across the world you know it's really the the globalization of music and that's through social media that's through streaming and it's just um you know, back then, back in the 90s, it was all about like, you know, distribution was about getting your records to certain stores and certain markets. Um, so it's just cool to see like you can be anywhere in the world and listen to whatever you want mm -hmm. and impact that impacts you. Um, but yeah, um, another actually, I, I want to ask you, um, you know, you've been in the city for, for a few years now. You're out. You're still in the city, but Jersey City, uh, but you work out here in the city. Now you're active in the scene. What New York City artists are really getting you excited right now? I think of artists in a lot of different formats. Like, first artist I'm going to shout out is a DJ, Dick Bayer. Dick Bayer is fire. Really doing his thing. We covered him for 137. I just love the energy behind his brand. I love, like, the authenticity there with everything he's doing. Um, it's, like, impossible not to root for him because he's so genuine and, and he's – really built a, a genuine community around his brand um on that same tip i'll talk about rome streets obviously <laughs> we're going to talk about griselda i have to mention rome streets um yeah it's like there's really an abundance of talent over here um and and within new york city and, and even outside of new york city across the country soundboy quad who i mentioned before one of my management clients um I got introduced to a large part of the DMV scene thanks to him and, you know, FNF Chop really doing his thing with RCA, um, O-Dog, like the list goes on and on. Um, one thing I find so interesting about music is there's just a rabbit hole of, of information and things to know about different areas, different artists in particular. So I've been super super into Detroit um and just like the Midwest I went to school in the Midwest for a bit got a little bit more exposed that way um you know Detroit scenes fire Detroit scenes crazy Babyface Ray Ice Flint, Ray Vizzo. Flint Michigan with Louis Ray um you know it's like it, it's crazy just the depth of it Michigan Boy Boat was a great example of just how fire Michigan is as a, as a state between uh, Detroit and Flint. Shout out Rio to Young OG as well for Flint. Um, GT from Detroit. 
you know, I swear, Vezza, we could go on and on uh, with the Detroit acts, but that's a scene where I feel like sort of bridges the gap between, you know, you see that you have old heads and then you have sort of the people that love the, the more modern approach to music. I feel like Detroit is somewhere in the middle where it, and just like Griselda, it could be appreciated by old heads and, you know, new heads, I guess you'd call them alike, where it, it, it's super agreeable. Um, and then, yeah, you know, LA's doing their thing, Florida, La Tyler, crazy. Well, Tyler, so far, he just did On the Radar, so hopefully by the time that you guys are listening to this, it's out. But um, he brings something cool to the table, you know? Definitely. And people think, like, everybody says he's 16, but he's, like, really 19. And, like, yeah. this is funny. But um, he's talented. He is. He's got a personality, too. And someone pointed out, I think it was a comment, like, he's this young kid who's, like, really living his dream and you could sense that in his energy when he's doing these interviews and whatever like he's really just having the time of his life doing what he's doing um and while we're talking about up and coming artists um and just artists to look out for new york city hosser pay attention to hosser he he made moves in web3 when that was more of a, a hot topic at the time working with glass and and dio over there um but yeah, Haas is doing some fire shit. Cash Cobain is doing some Cash fire Cobain shit. Cash Cobain and Charlie, coolest New York duo, like, right now. It's just, like, Sliz 2, like, I don't know. They're just up to something. I think they're performing as we're recording at South By. Um, wish I was there to see that, but uh, they're they're sick as hell. Same here. And, and while we're talking about New York Underground, um, let's talk about Half Moon. Half Moon has really been instrumental in, in the DJ scene in New York and, and connecting the dots there and really catering towards an interest that didn't disappear on that front that was kind of lost for a little bit. I feel like they are really carrying in a lot of ways in New York. They've thrown a South By event as well. Um, and Shawnee Bin Laden's out there. Shout out Shawnee Bin Laden. I mean, we were talking a little bit earlier about uh, like the sample beats and sort of how that could be a conflict of interest. Meanwhile, that's like some of people's favorite music right now. Yeah, that's how Polo Perks' whole brand is based off sampled like drill uh, punk songs. Like, yep. it's like, it's a big like, even Surf Gang, that's whole, the Surf Gang's whole thing is sampling these, these, uh, these punk rock songs. Like, it's cool. No, it's really cool. I feel like what we were talking about earlier with bridging the gap between old heads and, and the modern generation that's the shit that like is agreeable music. Maybe you don't love the rapping approach for some listeners, but you can't hate on the beat that takes something that is already familiar to you that you love and just puts a modern spin on it. Like it's crazy. I mean, Shawnee, I, I know people who hear his music and the value, the highest value is put into the beat. Like they're like, oh, this beat's crazy. But at the same time, I know people who, and myself included, like just love the vocal approach there, same with Polo Perks, where it's like, you know, there's there's a class of artists that aren't just getting a, a fire beat together. They're doing something with it. And I think those are the people to look out for, for real. Yeah. Also, I want to say, since I mentioned him, you mentioned him, shout out Polo Perks. Um, I heard some of his unreleased music, and he's about to change a lot of things very soon. He's flipping a lot of, like, he's taking it uh, like a I don't even want to spoil it he's taking a new approach to um to his sound but like also kind of in a from like somewhat of a familiar way it's like okay I expect him to do that but he sampled like he posted an Alex G snippet where he sampled Alex G and everybody's like going crazy for it so um it's cool to see shout out Polo shout out Gerald all them uh Judasia but um another artist I want to talk about um also close with is uh want to talk about tia corinne also guys 